there's something that you're dealing with physically, emotionally, financially, spiritually, I'm going to ask the members of the board to come to the front right now, and we're going to spend some time just praying for the needs of the church. So members of the board, if you would come and get in position, and let's just ask God to meet our needs. Come if you have a special need this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. This is almost a perfect church. Almost nobody has any needs. Pray for those that have come, would you? Join with the board members here that are praying and interceding. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Father God, you are faithful. Father Linda and I were just saying this morning or yesterday, I can't remember, but how faithful you have been to us. God, there have been times we needed a special touch from you, a special provision, and you have been faithful. Thank you, God. Father, all we have seen has taught us to trust the Creator for all that we have not seen. And so, Father, right now we trust for you to meet the needs of our brothers and sisters that have come forward. Lord, there may be some who have stayed back in their seats, but they have needs too. Father, we pray for them. Lord, whatever that need is, God, we gather together in the name of Jesus. Jesus, you are here in our midst. Holy Spirit, you are present. You are the comforter. Jesus has said that he would send you to lead us into all truth, to comfort us, to empower us, to be witnesses. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. And Father, God, you are our daddy. We know that you love us that you care for us, that you provide for us. So right now, Lord, hear the hearts of your people. You've told us to ask, to seek, and to knock. And you would hear us. Thank you, God, for the answers to prayer right now. We look forward to the testimonies, the praise to you for your faithfulness, and that you would be glorified. Now, Father, we also ask for your anointing and the preaching of your word that it would instruct us and encourage us, Lord, in your word, that you would be glorified in our lives as we worship you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen Amen and amen. Amen. Praise God. You can be seated. Join me in this. This is my Bible. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. With it, I can be victorious. I can be a champion for life. Amen. You can open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to talk this morning about caution. Christians under construction. Christians under construction. Before I do that, let me share with you this uh, response, some of you may have heard it. If you've heard it before, don't stop me. There may be somebody else who hasn't. Anyhow, response to an insurance company. It says, I am writing in response to your request for additional information. In block number three of the accident form, I put, trying to do the job alone as a cause of my accident. You said in your letter that I should explain more fully, and I trust that the following details will be sufficient. I'm a bricklayer by trade. On the date of the accident, I was working alone on the roof of a new six-story building. When I completed my work, I found that I had about 500 pounds of brick left over. Rather than carry the bricks down by hand, I decided to lower them in a barrel by using a pulley, which fortunately was attached to the side of the building at the sixth floor. Securing the rope at the ground level, I went up to the roof, swung the barrel out, and loaded the bricks into it. 
Then I went back to the ground and untied the rope, holding it tightly to ensure a slow descent of the 500 pounds of brick. You'll note in block number 11 of the accident report that I weigh 135 pounds. But to my surprise at being jerked off the ground so suddenly, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. Needless to say, I proceeded at a rather rapid rate up the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming down. This explains the fractured skull and broken collarbone. Slowed only slightly, I continued my rapid ascent, not stopping until the fingers of my right hand were two knuckles deep into the pulley. Fortunately, by this time, I had regained my presence of mind, was able to hold tightly to the rope in spite of my pain. At approximately the same time, however, the barrel of bricks hit the ground and the bottom fell out of the barrel. Devoid of the weight of the bricks, the barrel then weighed approximately 50 pounds. I refer you again to my weight in block number 11. As you might imagine, I began a rapid descent down the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming up. This accounts for the two fractured ankles and the lacerations of my legs and lower body area. The encounter with the barrel slowed me enough to lessen my injuries when I fell onto the pile of bricks, and fortunately only three vertebrae were cracked. I'm sorry to report, however, that as I lay there on the bricks in pain, unable to stand, and watching the empty barrel six stories above me, I again lost my presence of mind and let go of the rope. The empty barrel weighed more than the rope, so it came back down on me and broke both my legs. I hope I have furnished the information you have required. Why do I share that silly story? Because every church is a construction site. Jesus is building his church. He's building this church, but we're building people up. Most construction sites are hard hat areas. It's easy to get hurt if you're not careful. That's why we have the instructions of Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, and verse 29. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Haven't we received a great calling? So we're called to live a life worthy of it. And that includes this. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. Bearing with one another. What in the world? Bearing with, we're all Christians here. Of course we love each other. We're all just like Jesus. We have Jesus in our hearts, in our minds. We want to glorify God in everything we say and do. Why would it be hard to bear with one another? We need instructions from Paul on this. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Then over in verse 29, he summarizes with this. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs so that it may benefit those who listen. No unwholesome talk coming out of your mouth, but only what is necessary to build people up. Anybody ever been hurt in church? You ever heard of anybody that was hurt in church? You ever hear over and over and over again about people being hurt in church? (laughs) How in the world do people get hurt in church? Bunch of Christians all coming together to praise the Lord and have a great time together, celebrate God's love. And people get hurt? Let me tell you one of the reasons I think so many people get hurt in church. They forget it's a construction site. And hard hats required. Soft hearts, but hard hats. <laughs> we can unrealistically expect everyone else to act like Jesus. And we're blindsided when people don't. And often we respond to that while well, they call themselves a Christian. Now, we can blindside people, too, with our tongues. But we say, well, but God knows I'm trying. (laughs) You may not have gotten that. When other people hurt us, we tend to say, and they call themselves a Christian. When we hurt other people, we say, well, God knows I'm trying. (laughs) I didn't mean it. I'm trying to be nice. But sometimes it just comes out. I just, I don't want to hold it. I just get it out there. It's like the guy with a shotgun who says, well, you know, I just 
had to pull the trigger. I'm sorry for what happened afterwards. Please accept my apology, but a lot of damage is done sometimes. We are, that people often feel betrayed if someone doesn't like them, doesn't notice them, or says something that offends them. But we need to be careful. Safety matters. It's very easy to tear down rather than build up. The tongue can be a dangerous weapon or a wonderful tool. We want it to be a wonderful tool, a power tool for building others up. We need to exercise caution. How can we use the tool of the tongue in ways that are helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen? Well, let's look at some ways that we can build people up. And let's come to church with an intentionality of not just seeing what we can receive, but seeing how we can be a blessing in building others up. Wouldn't that be great if everybody that came to church? Now, it's wonderful when we've got people coming to church that don't know anything about Jesus, and they learn about Jesus. They don't understand God's love, but they learn that the Father loves them. But those of us that call ourselves Christian, we often come to church just to see what we can get out of it. But oh, what a church. When its members come with the idea of, I'm going to be blessed and be a blessing. Isn't that a great idea? Amen. Come to church to be blessed and to be a blessing. To be intentional as part of the building crew, part of the construction crew that is very careful <laughs> because it is a construction site that we build up one another. So how can we do that? Let me suggest just three ways. There are more, I'm sure, but... What I want to talk about this morning is to build others up through words of acceptance, words of instruction, and words of encouragement. Words of acceptance, words of instruction, and words of encouragement. First of all, we build up with words of acceptance. Romans 5 eight says, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Notice that Christ didn't wait for us to get everything together and to be nice, and to be lovable, before he died for us. While we were still sinners, he died for us. You may have some people come to church that just rub you the wrong way. Anybody ever encountered anybody that rubbed them the wrong way? Anybody live with anybody that rubs them the wrong way? <laughs> that can happen. That can happen. Sometimes we just get rubbed the wrong way like rubbing a cat the wrong way. They just don't like it. And sometimes people, I just don't like them. I wonder if Jesus could look at some of us before he died and say, you see that Bob Richardson? I just don't like him. <laughs> he just rubs me the wrong way. And I'll tell you, before I was saved, I don't think Jesus liked me very much, but he loved me. He loved me enough to die for me. And uh, sometimes we get people, fellow Christians that come to church and they just rub us the wrong way. They're just not our cup of tea. They're just not like me. It happens. How do we deal with that? Well, we recognize, first of all, the value of another. Psalm 139, 13 and 14 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So I look at my brother Don back there, wave Don, and I say, God's works are good. I know that full well. God created him. He creates good things. I say the same thing about Stuart. Right? I say the same thing about Dee. Everybody I meet, I recognize they're unique. God created them. And God places value on their lives because they're his child. Even before they're saved. Even before they act saved. 
Even when they act saved most of the time, but once in a while they don't. They're God's creation. We accept them as God's child. And we vow to treat them like God's child. If we look at every individual that comes through the door and those outside the door that won't walk in (laughs) and remember God created them. God loves them. God has a plan for their life. God's future for them is wonderful if they will receive God's plan for their life. And we want them to help discover that. And then once they're saved, we want them to help grow in that. We want to build them up. But everyone's different. So we recognize the individuality of another. Romans 12, 4 through 6 says, For just as each of us have one body and many, with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. 1 Corinthians says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, still to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Let me tell you something. Uh, People with different gifts often have different personalities. I remember hearing someone once say that a person with a gift of prophecy, the resident gift of prophecy, the prophetic prophet, and the person with a gift of mercy sometimes don't think the other one's saved. Uh, The person with the gift of the prophet is often very blunt and very straightforward and distinguishes between right and wrong, black and white. There's no gray. It's right or it's wrong. And if you're on the wrong side of right, they want to set you right, even if they do it wrong. And so they can come across as unloving, uncaring, and sensitive when all they're doing is trying to be faithful to God and help build you up. But it sure doesn't feel that way sometimes, especially the person with the gift of mercy who wants to just let them feel good, wants to help them, wants to bless them, doesn't want to hurt them, very aware of the sensitivity of another person's feelings. And the person that has a prophetic gift Sometimes feels a person with the gift of mercy is just compromising, wishy-washy, doesn't really stand for anything. And the person with the gift of mercy feels the gift of prophet is unloving, uncaring, and insensitive. And they sometimes rub each other the wrong way. But how many of you know they've got different gifts and God uses both of them? Amen. Amen. And if they'll build each other up and recognize each other's gift, as part of the building process, the mason needs the electrician, right? Different giftings, different ways of working, different tools, and yet they're both involved in the building process. Caution, Christians are under construction. We need all the gifts and all the people. Therefore, Romans 14, 19, and 15, 1 and 2 say, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. If we come to church with intentionality, then we recognize that others there are trying to build up as well. We also recognize that none of us are perfect at it. And the different gifts have different personalities. Some of our individuality is in our personality. Some is in our past experiences. Some in our length of being saved. And some in our unique giftings. So acceptance is not on the condition that people change, but that God will be changing them. I love the quote from Leighton Ford, Billy Graham's brother-in-law. 
who said that God loves us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. <laughs> Aren't you glad that God wants us to grow? Amen. Wants us to become more like his son. So we recognize that, but we greet people and we see people and we say, I see you. I value you. I know God has great plans for you. Let me give a practical idea about how this can work. Any of you ever been a visitor to church? I know some of you have. You are today. A visitor to church. Whenever Linda and I, and we had our children home with us, we went on vacation, we would always on Sundays go to church. And uh, it was awkward. I don't like being a visitor. How many of you like being a visitor? You'd like that feeling of not knowing anybody and nobody knowing you. I, I don't like it. I like to come to a church where I know everybody and everybody knows me and I feel comfortable. I know what's going to happen. I know the different people. I see the smiles on their face. They're happy to see me. I'm happy to see them. In fact, I'll tell them it's good for to see me. And uh, <laughs> some of you get that a little later. You quite often say, hi, you know, it's good to see you. And I say, yeah, it's good to see me. Uh, anyhow. Sometimes it's awkward being a visitor. I had a pastor friend who uh, was one of my board members at my last church, came on pastoral staff after he retired. And uh, so he would go away on vacation, and I'd ask him where he went to church. Well, he was going, oh, we didn't go to church. And I said, what? You don't go to church when you're on vacation? No, we're on vacation. So how long has it been since you've experienced being a visitor? Oh, years. You forgot what it's like to be a visitor, so when we get visitors here, you have no idea how they're feeling? Just think about all the barriers they had to cross to come here. They had to be determined to visit. And when they get here, you're not sensitive and aware of what they may be feeling? Now, for those of you who go on vacation and don't go to church, I'm only an interim pastor, so I can say this. Shame on you. <laughs> we need to experience that. So we're sensitive to, we have several visitors here this morning. I've met some of you. And I want you to know we're happy you're here. We want you to feel like you're welcome, that you, we value you. You're a child of God. And he has great plans for you. I, I hope that when you come here, you feel that. That that is encouraging you. You're built up in your relationship with God because of the welcome you receive here. So when we come with intentionality, we realize there are different people here we know that may sometimes rub us the wrong way. There are people here we know that we just fit right in with them and they have great personalities that respond to our personalities and we get along great but we don't just spend time talking to the ones we get along great with because the ones that we sometimes rub the wrong way are also valued children of God and need to know that we accept them for who they are and right the way they are, even if we do pray that God is changing them. <laughs> and sometimes in those prayers, God says, what about you? Maybe they're not the ones who need to change so much. Am I making sense? It's a construction site. It can get dangerous. People can get hurt. But if we're aware of that, we're doing our best to let people know that we see them, we value them, and we believe God has great plans for them. So we use our tongue to convey those, that information. And right in front of our tongue is a smile. That can say a lot before the tongue starts speaking. But let's move on. We build up with words of instruction. We all need to grow in knowledge and grace. And instruction comes from the Lord, but usually through people. 
Let me suggest some ways that we recognize instruction from the Lord through people. Let's start with the Bible. Right? This is my Bible. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do with it. I can be victorious. I can be a champion for Christ. We know that. But we think about the fact God used people to write this. So through people inspired of God from ages ago, he gave us instructions. Instructions about who he is, what he expects from us, what he has promises to do for us. The Bible is a word of instruction. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. How many of you believe that sounds like a building program? We need instruction. Uh, we accept people the way they are, believing that God will be changing them just as he's changing me. We need to accept ourselves, by the way, where we're at, believing that God is changing us and building us and creating in us more and more of the image of Christ. But I remember one time telling a, a young girl that was having a bit of a fit on a Sunday night service, and uh, I had to tell her, you know, you are welcome here. We would love to have you be here, but the attitude has got to go. If you'd prefer the attitude to our friendship, then you have to leave with the attitude, but the attitude's got to go. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We love people, we accept people, but there are certain behaviors that are unacceptable. <laughs> Doesn't mean we don't accept them, love them, value them, believe God has a plan for their life, but Sometimes people need some instruction. And we need to be careful about how we instruct. So we refer to God's word, first of all. Read the Bible. That was one of the focuses of my ministry. It's been a focus of Pastor Phil's ministry when he's here with us, was be in the word yourself. Know God's word. It is instruction and it is life, it says. It blesses us. It tells us how God wants us to live. And why does God want us to live? Because he loves us. He wants us to obey his, his precepts. He wants us to find wisdom. Now, I know there are people that pick and choose. They only obey the parts that they agree with or understand. But all of God's word is profitable. <laughs> So those who truly prosper are those who obey what they don't understand because it's God's word. And we need instruction. And the Bible tells us our own hearts are uh, wicked and uh, we, we don't understand our own hearts. So when we trust God's word for instruction better than we trust our own conscience or our own reasoning, God says there's life in that. There's blessing in that. There's prosperity in that. There's joy in that. There's peace in that. God wants to bless us. So he's told us what we can do in order to make sure we're receiving his blessing. He doesn't use just the prophets of old. It says in 2 Timothy 1, 20 and 21, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Well, we still have prophets. There is still the gift of prophecy in the church. We're Pentecostal and we're glad of it. It's not the same as the prophecy of the, of the Bible. In the Bible, there are those who spoke, there were those who wrote, but it went through a lengthy process of determining what was from God and what wasn't. A lot of prophets that I've encountered in today's age just say, well, God told me, so you've got to believe it. So well, let it stand the test of time. Let it go through a vetting process. Let a bunch of people look at it, compare it to other words from God's word, and make sure that it sounds like God. 
And I've had people get upset with me that, they question, that I questioned it. What? <laughs> they questioned the scriptures to make sure they were from the word of, they were the word of God. And now you're going to spout off something, say God said it, so I've got to do it? I don't think so. But there are those who get a word from God, a prophetic word, that are willing to let that be vetted, let it be examined, let others look at it and decide whether that's from God or not, and then act on it or not. But understanding uh, and correction comes through prophetic words, comes through people. There's also the ministry offices that God says he uses to instruct people. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 says, so Christ himself, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a verse. Back up, Brandon, or whoever's doing this. 1 Corinthians 14, 3 says, but the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. That's one of the things the New Testament tells us about prophetic words today, is that they speak to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Not to embarrass them in front of the congregation, not to tear them down, not to try to kick them out of the church, or say that I was right and you were wrong. Prophetic word today is for strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. The ministry offices, let me get back to that one. Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Some of you heard me say, people say, well, who do you think you are, Pastor Bob? I think I'm God's gift to the church. Tongue in cheek. All right, those of you. you know. <laughs> but God gave the ministry gifts, right? And so there's instructions from God's word for people like me that I'm to instruct people, correct them, even rebuke them at times. But what's the purpose of it? To make them mad? To show that I'm better than they are? Of course not, I'm not. <laughs> but to help us all be built up into the image of Christ. Anybody ever been wrong since you got saved? <laughs> but let me see a couple more hands, because just three doesn't do it. Yeah. There are times that we, we're wrong. We need to be corrected. We need to be further instructed. Because our desire is to be more like Christ. To be, to share his love. To walk in his steps. And to glorify the Father. Isn't that the desire of our hearts? Once we recognize that Jesus died for us, that all of our sins are forgiven because of what Jesus did on Calvary, that we are promised an eternity in heaven with the blessings of God's presence all the time. That is the gift of God to us. Doesn't it make you want to be more like that? To be more like him? To be a blessing to people? I often, in my correspondence with people, will say, be blessed, will close with, be blessed, be a blessing. <laughs> Some people are okay with the first part. They have trouble with the second part. You know, they want to be blessed, but it never dawned on them to be a blessing because of that being blessed. We want to be blessed so we can be a blessing. Amen. Amen. Where am I at? <laughs> oh, one other. And this is the one that probably needs as much uh, help as any. <laughs> And that is friends. A source of instruction is friends. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Another verse says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. A mistake that I have seen in church oftentimes is people that know in passing their acquaintances. They know them from church. And they try instructing somebody that they have not built a friendship with. And that is often not received well. 
I did a lot of counseling in my first church. And uh, I found that very often, a person would come in, share what their issues were, and I knew what they needed to do before the session was over. But I'd have to meet with them half a dozen times before I could tell them. Does that make sense? Sometimes we can be too quick to tell people what they need to hear. But as we build a relationship, we find that there is an atmosphere, there is a relationship that can handle feedback that is hard to hear sometimes. Instruction is for the purpose of construction, not destruction. When building something, we need patience and the right tool at the right time. We need to be careful about forcing something when it doesn't fit. Jesus understood this, and he said to his disciples in John 16, 12, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. <laughs> Jesus re realized that, that there is a, a timing factor <laughs> in telling people what they need to hear. I remember reading a commentary one time, William Barclay, I believe it was, that talked about a well-known teacher in England, years ago, obviously, and talked about how she could correct you very pointedly, very directly, but when she did, it felt like she had an arm around your shoulder. <laughs> now, isn't it nice when people can correct you but you know it's in the spirit of love for your own good and that there's an arm around your shoulder and thank you, I needed that. But somebody just comes up to you and says, well, you need to change this. Well, you ought to be doing that. That's sometimes not received well. In fact, I would say percentage-wise, 99.9%. .9%, that's not received well. So. If we're going to instruct friends, we ought to make sure that we built a relationship where that can be received and be building up and not tearing down. When we have a church that knows how to use their tongue for building up and recognize that people can be hurt when we aren't safety conscious, <laughs> then I believe it helps build a healthy church that can help present a healthy God to a hurting world. Finally, we build up with words of encouragement. One definition of encouragement is to add courage. Sometimes we become frustrated, discouraged, or frightened. We need to be built up in the most holy faith. Sometimes our failures and our past hurts can make us extra sensitive. There's a story told of a guy named Randy Reed. Now, I don't know if this is a true story or not, but it's told as one. Randy Reed, a 34-year-old welder, was working near the top of a newly constructed water tower outside Chicago when he slipped and fell 110 feet to the ground below. Barely missing rocks and debris, Reed landed on a six-foot soft pile of dirt near the base of the tower. Within minutes, rescue workers responded to the 911 call made by Reed's panicked co-workers who had watched him plummet to the ground. Miraculously, a bruised lung was the only injury the shaken construction worker sustained. Ironically, as he was being carried to the ambulance on a stretcher three feet above the ground, he looked into the faces of the paramedics and nervously pleaded, please don't drop me. Now, he hadn't been afraid to go up on the top of this tower just a few minutes before, but now three feet. <laughs> In a previous life, uh, iteration of life, I don't believe in reincarnation, just so you know, for the folks out there, internet land. Uh, I was a elementary school phys ed teacher, a coach, they call him here but I was just a phys ed teacher. And one of the units we would do was a gymnastics unit. And especially my fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, I would do a little exercise since I had the mats out. And I would have them do what I referred to as a trust game. And they would have a partner, usually it'd be a friend of theirs because they got to pick their own partner. And so 
I would say, here's, here's what I want you to do. One of you stand looking away from the other person, fold your arms across your chest, and when your partner says go, keep your legs locked and fall straight back. Now here's what I want your partner to do. Stand up right close to you with his hands right by your shoulders, and then when he says go, you fall back, but you're gonna fall into his hands, or her hands, and they're going to support you. And then I want you to do it again, but I want your partners catching you to be back a little further. And then I would show them how to receive, so you know, it wasn't all hitting the wall, you know, but to receive them. And then let's see which one of you can get closest to the mat before your partner catches you. How many of you know that's fun? <laughs> it was fun to watch because some kids, they would just boom, go back. And they had no problem with it. Other kids, it was like, you know what kids had developed trust in their life experiences and what ones had been hurt. <laughs> Didn't trust very much. But I would have them do that. They'd do it for a while. They'd have a lot of fun. And then I would sit them all down. And I would ask them, uh, now what would happen if you did that, you built up a lot of trust. You were way, way down before you caught the person, but you did a good job catching them. And then you told them to do it again, but this time you decided you'd play a trick on them. Instead of catching them, you would just stand back. Wham! Now, they're falling back far enough now they can't catch themselves. You know, if it's just here, they can catch themselves, and they'll be all right. But if they've learned to really trust, to trust you, and they fall way back, now, if you don't catch them, they can't catch themselves. And what do you think is going to happen? Do you think you can say, I was just teasing, let's do it again, and they're going to trust you now? You've got to reestablish trust now. It's going to take longer than it did the first time you did it. And I would talk to them about secrets shared with them that they had a friend and the friend shared a secret with them. And then out on the playground, you decided to tell everybody the secret and laugh at your friend and have everybody else laugh at them. Or you got mad at them. So you told, I'm gonna tell everybody what you told me. You think they're gonna trust you the next day because you said, I'm sorry? <laughs> Folks, we have people coming to church that have been hurt. They have trusted Parents, spouses, co-workers, pastors, friends at church, and they have been dropped, and it hurt. And then you expect them to come to church and say, oh, trust me. Why? You have to build trust. You have to put courage back into them, and it takes time. It takes patience. It takes love. It takes gentleness. People come needing to be built up. It takes courage to be what we're called to be. Deuteronomy 138, God speaking to Moses says, but your assistant Joshua, son of Nun, will enter it. Encourage him because he will lead Israel to inherit it. It goes on to say in, in chapter 3, verse 28, but commission Joshua and encourage and strengthen him, for he will lead the people across and will cause them to inherit the land that you will see. 1 Thessalonians 4, 18 and 5, 11 says, therefore encourage one another with these words. And then in 5, 11, therefore encourage one another and build each other up, just <laughs> as in fact you are doing. <coughs> God calls us to great things. He calls us to be great people that can be a blessing in our world. I think I've told some of you that when I was on a, a trip to Israel that our travel guide was a, was a native-born Israeli. And he, the travel group I was with, with were all clergy all pastors. And he got talking to us and he said at one point, I'll never forget it, he said, I believe the only answer to the conflict in the Middle East, 
are Christians. Now this is a Jew, born in Israel, but he says the only solution to the crisis in Israel are Christians. And then he explained why. He says, because you're the only ones who seem to have a grasp of forgiveness. <laughs> Folks, our whole theology is forgiveness. Our forgiveness. God forgave us. Amen. We know what Israel is going through right now. We know what Palestine is going through. We know what the conflict between Jews and Muslims is. And we're to be the solution. And how are we going to be the solution if we can't get along with each other? If we can't build up each other, if we tear down each other? It'll never work. How can we be a solution to those in our own neighborhoods, our own schools, our own offices, our own workplaces, in our own city? How can we be a solution unless we know how to build up one another. And we leave here every Sunday morning encouraged because we have been to church and we've been built up in the most holy faith. That's what God wants. That's what Jesus is building in his church. The tongue is a mighty force. We can use it to tear down or to build up. Now, let me conclude with this. James 3, 2 says, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. I would like to conclude by asking all of the perfect people here to stand up. I, maybe you didn't hear me. All of the perfect people, as we dismiss, would you please stand up? Yeah, what's my point? None of us do this perfectly. We have all said and done things. I have said and done things that have torn down and that built up. In my own home, in my churches that I pastored, to my friends, to visitors, unknowingly, carelessly, forgetting that this is a construction site, that safety first, to guard my tongue, to value people, to instruct them with gentleness and kindness and truth from God's word in a spirit of love and to encourage them because life is hard. Being like Jesus is work. We all struggle with it. He calls us to great things and we say, I don't know if I can do that. I can't be that. When we come to church We need to be built up. We need to be builders. Here I am, Bob the Builder. Can we build it? Yes, we can. We can do it. I hope that you're encouraged this morning. I hope you're instructed this morning in love and gentleness. And I hope you feel accepted this morning because you're a child of God and he's a good, good father. Stand with me, would you please? Just take a moment to ask God to seal to your heart what you need from this message. how it can produce fruit in you. Thank you, Jesus.
Father God, thank you for loving us. Sometimes we feel so unlovable. Sometimes we feel like such failures. Sometimes, God, we feel superior. Forgive us, God. We want to be more like Jesus every day. We want to make you proud of us. We want to honor and glorify you. We want to touch others with your love, that struggle to feel your love, that have never known your love. God, some that we encounter that struggle to believe that they even deserve to be alive and are questioning whether they should be or not. God, may our lives reflect your love for your people. Thank you, God, that you have promised to use us to build others up. We submit our lives to you as instruments of your peace. This is our reasonable service of worship. So we leave this worship service to be worshipers this week and glorify your name. Now, Father, bless my brothers and sisters. Bless them, God, with all spiritual blessings. Provide for every need so they can be a witness of your love and your goodness, of your promises, of your faithfulness. God, bless them to be a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Thank you for being here today. We look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thank you.